to New Zealand, this time in a season of preparation, the tremendous evangelistic outreach in this nation. And I thank God for that. I have a passionate love for evangelism and a tremendous admiration of God called evangelists, although that is not my own primary calling. I do believe in God's guidance and overruling in my life, and I believe there must have been a special purpose in bringing me here at this time. And I feel that in a sense God wants me to challenge you, the Christians of this nation, with what is implied evangelistic outreach that's going to be taking place. I want to suggest to you that in the long run there may be a greater chance for you than for the unconverted. I've never met Brother Louis Palau, but I've seen the fruits of his ministry in London. I've seen how scores and scores of punks and skinheads and people like that who never darkened the doors of the church found Jesus Christ in a dramatic and personal way. And I know particularly one church to which they were directed. And I can tell you that the impact on that church was traumatic. Because they didn't know any of the church traditions about how you ought to behave. They, uh, you know, they weren't familiar with the hinge. They just came in and expected more of what they'd been getting. And uh, they came in quite large numbers in that church, revolutionized it, turned it upside down. And quite a number of the older members complained, these young people have taken our church from us. Because their mistake was calling it our church, because it was the church. I want to suggest to you that if there's a great harvest from the evangelism, and that harvest is directed into the churches of this nation, it's going to present a you with a real challenge. See, in 1954, if you can believe that people were doing as long ago as that, I served a counselor in Billy Graham's first crusade in Haringey in London. And I went through all courses and I thank God for the instruction I received. And I conscientiously did my best to follow all the instructions. I cut 22 persons. I followed everyone up with phone calls, with letters, with visits. I'd have to say at the end of it all, I didn't have any real assurance that more than two of those 22 persons really became committed Christians and effective members of a church. Coincidentally, it was my church that they became members of. So that one out of eleven, now that's no criticism of the message that Billy Graham brought. But somebody said at that time about the situation with the church in London, it's a mistake to put a live chick under a dead hen. <laughs> so what I want to impress upon you is that in all probability, you are going to be faced with a tremendous responsibility to represent the reality of the Christian faith to people who didn't win it, knew nothing about it, and perhaps still have some area of skepticism within them. And you know what they're going to do? They're not going to just listen to the sermons or sing the hymns. They're going to watch the lives of the church members. And that ultimately is probably what will influence most of them as to whether their commitment to Christ will be permanent or not. So I'm going to do my best with the Lord's help to teach on themes which I believe are desperate in the contemporary church in the West to produce the kind of Christian that Jesus expects. You see, I've been telling American Christians recently I don't believe that Jesus died merely to produce a slightly better average group of American citizens who meet fairly regularly in a kind of social 
institution every Sunday morning. I don't believe that you can find any hint of that in the nest. What tends to happen in the church is that we receive what God has said in his word and we adjust it and we suit it to our own convenience and our own way of doing things and our own culture and our own standards and we still continue to give it the names and the label of the New Testament but we're mislabeling it because the things to which we're attaching Christian labels are not things to which Jesus and the apostles attach them. I want to suggest that it would be good for all of us, and that does not exclude myself, to subject ourselves to a period of self-examination. And in doing this, I want to lay a very thorough scriptural basis for it. I'd like to turn, first of all, to two passages in the first epistle of Peter. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. I suppose it's not a coincidence that we were singing a beautiful chorus in which we were affirming that we called God, which as I'm sure all of you know is the Aramaic or Hebrew for Father or Daddy. And it so happens that in this very passage I've selected, Peter reminds the believers Calling God Daddy carries with it tremendous responsibility. He says here, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your learning here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your father. Now that's very contrary to the thinking of most Christians that I meet in the Western world today. They say we call God Daddy, and we know we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, so we're free to please ourselves, to set our own steps, to live the kind of life that suits us. Peter says the exact opposite. He said, if all God Father remember that he judged each one, not according to what he says, but according to what he does. And it's very, very obvious that Peter's not talking about God judging the unconverted. He's talking about God judging his people. And he reminds us that in the light of this, we spend our earthly time of sojourning in fear. I wonder how many of you have really ever appreciated that. That's not a slave fear, but it's a sense of awe, a sense of reverence, it's a tremendous sense of respect and of responsibility. And Peter gives a reason. Remember what it cost God to redeem you the precious blood of his son. And in the light of, God, of the price that God paid, don't ever make your faith cheap. Brothers and sisters, grace is free, but it's not cheap. Peter challenges us. Accept the challenge. It applies to me as much as to anybody here. But I pass the challenge on to you all. Remember, you call God's Father, he's going to judge you on the basis of the way you live. And remember what it cost God, the infinite price, the precious blood of his Son. God doesn't consider you cheap. One of the big mistakes that many Christians make is to consider themselves much less valuable than God considers. If you owned a really precious stone of any kind, a ring, something like that, you would normally take extra precautions about where you keep it, how you protect it. You'd have it in your mind. Well, God thinks like that about you and me. Because of the price he paid, 
He's particularly interested in and concerned about us. If you turn on in First Peter to the fourth chapter, verses 17 and 18, Peter returns to this theme. And my personal impression is that this is a particularly timely verse for the people of God in what I call the Western Church. The church in the United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, mainly English-speaking nations, not exclusively. Scandinavia would be included also. A church that has a long heritage of biblical knowledge and religious freedom. And nations, all of whom, all of whose history have been influenced beyond the order of essence by the impact of the Word of God. And this is what Peter says. For time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Who are the house of God? We are. That's right. I mean, he doesn't leave it in any doubt because he goes on to say, and if it begins with us, then what will be the end of who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if righteous is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? I don't suppose that many of you have been confronted with that statement that the righteous is scarce to say. Now there are many other aspects. But that is one aspect that we cannot overlook. Furthermore, God's word gives us the infinite privilege of judging ourselves. You turn to First Kings chapter 11. Paul urges us to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged by God. But when we are judged, we are chastened or disciplined by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. There are three levels. The best level is judge yourself. Then God won't have to judge you. If you fail to do that, God will bring some kind of disciplinary judgment upon you to bring you to repentance. But if you fail in that, the lowest level is to be condemned with the world. I want to provide you in these talks a number of scriptural standards by which we should judge ourselves. I cannot compel you to do it. I can merely offer you the opportunity. I want to say that I'm not a hypocrite and I have been ready to apply these standards to my own life. I'm going to tell you and spend much of my time for these studies in the Epistle to the Galatians. This is an epistle that I have more or less lived in for two or three years now. The epistle to the Galatians was written, I would say, by Paul, primarily to deal with a problem. What was the problem? Well, people could offer different suggestions, but I think most serious Bible commentators would say that the problem of the Galatian church was legalism. And it's very interesting to see Paul's attitude towards it. Normally when he wrote to churches such as the Corinthians or the Thessalonians or the Colossians or others, he began by thanking God for what God was doing in them. And it was very rare for him, and in fact I think this, this is the only case in which Paul doesn't begin his letters by thanking God for the people he's writing to. When he wrote uh, the first epistle to the Corinthians, there were all sorts of problems in the church. There was immorality, incest, drunkenness at the Lord's table. 
But Paul still began by thanking God for his grace to the Corinthians. Now, by the standards that most of us are used to, legalism would seem to be much less of a problem than drunkenness, morality, or incense. But the amazing thing is that Paul was so disturbed about the condition of the Galatians, he didn't have time to thank God for them. He just said, I'm amazed that you so quickly departed from the gospel. In other words, for him, legalism was a much greater threat to the well-being of God's people than some very obvious carnal sins like drunkenness or immorality. I was speaking to quite a large group of Christians a little while back, and in the course of what I was saying, I said something which I didn't think would be the least surprising. I said, of course, you realize that Christianity is not a set of I looked at those people's faces, I felt to myself, if I told them there was no God, they would have been less shocked. But I still affirm that Christianity is not a set of rules. Israel had had a God-given set of rules for something like 14 centuries before Jesus came. God couldn't improve on that set of rules, it was perfect. Jesus didn't come to bring a set of rules. He came with a different objective. And any time we reduce Christianity to a set of rules, we've missed the purpose of God. And I suppose God is as much concerned as Paul was about this. Now I want to start in Galatians with a verse that has absolutely burned itself into my consciousness. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I suppose I read this verse over many years, perhaps 40 years, I suppose hundreds of times. And it never impacted me. But just recently, I just can't, every time I come to it, I have to talk. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Now, if you have one of the modern versions, like the NASB or the NIV, part of that verse is left out. Don't let that confuse you, it, does, it so happens that there are many different Greek texts of the New Testament and some words in that others don't. And it's a matter for scholarship and prayer to determine which is the more probable text, but it doesn't make any real difference to the meaning. Let's take a shortened version which was, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Now, you say, well, what kind of Christians were these that they had been bewitched? Well, the answer is they were charismatic Christians by our standards. They knew the Lord, they'd received the Holy Spirit, and they had witnessed miracles performed amongst them. This follows from the next verses. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So they'd received the Holy Spirit. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? You see how deeply concerned Paul is? He said, maybe it was all in vain. He says a little later on in the epistle, I'm afraid lest I've bestowed labor upon you in vain. I've wasted my time. I'm not going to see any real permanent fruit. Verse 5, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? So Paul emphasized that they had received the Holy Spirit and they'd experienced God working miracles amongst them. So, we charismatics don't have any experience as charismatics that they hadn't had. And yet, says Paul says, you're bewitched. That's a rather shocking statement, isn't it?
What was the evidence that they were bewitched? It's all contained that before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed crucified. Paul had come and presented the truth of the death and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus in tremendous clarity. They'd received it, believed on it, and enjoyed all these experiences. But then another spiritual force had come in, and what had it done? It had obscured what was accomplished by the death of Jesus on the cross. So that Paul says, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed, crucified, but you've lost the vision. You don't see it any longer. It's still empty, and fruit are no longer manifest among you. You see, the cross is the place where all human needs were met, once and for all. But once we lose the side of the cross, we begin to live in our needs again. The cross was the where Satan was finally and totally defeated. That's number one reason why he wants to obscure what was accomplished on the cross. Because once that's obscured, he begins to regain his power over us. Meditation has caused me to follow two themes, and I'll try to follow them both. First of all, I became extremely concerned as to what was the real nature of witchcraft. How could witchcraft gain influence over Christians who had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and experienced the spiritual working power of God? Secondly, and parallel with that, I gained a tremendous desire to know really was the significance of the death of Jesus on the cross. What was accomplished by it that Satan was so eager to steal from us? And so this caused me to go in two directions. One was to analyze the nature of witchcraft. The other was to analyze what we are entitled to as our inheritance through the death of Jesus on the cross. I don't intend to dwell for too long on nature of witchcraft. My main theme in these meetings will be the cross and what was accomplished by it. First of all, let me say, when I speak about the cross, I'm not speaking about a wooden or a metal cross that hangs around a person's neck or on the wall of a church. I'm not criticizing them, I'm against them, but I don't mean that. When I talk about cross, I mean that which was accomplished by the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But rather than use that long phrase all the time, I'm simply going to say the cross. What is the nature of which cross? Well, I, perhaps I better go back because there's a personal background to this. In 1979, I was at a convention or conference in the state of Missouri, in the United States. And in the middle of one of the meetings, a young man whom I'd never seen before, and I don't think I've ever seen him since, came forward and gave a very remarkable prophecy. And it wasn't really directly connected with any of the themes of the conference. Now, I, I have this prophecy, it was recorded on tape, and I have a typed version of it. But I won't try to quote it at length, i just simply say two things. It didn't kind of begin with a preamble. It said, all the Lord has been doing against witchcraft up to this time has been nothing but preliminary submissions. But from now on, God is declared total war on witchcraft. And then it says, the reason is because witchcraft has millions of men bound whom God needs in his end time army. And then as a kind of PS, it said, and as you engage in this war, 
you will encounter people who are under curses that have been passed on from generation to generation. But you do not need to be afraid because you will have power to release them from those curses. Well, up that time, was 79, I had hardly given any thought whatever to the theme curses. And I didn't immediately decide, well, this is a theme I must examine, but in the course of experience, and dealing with people and situations, in the next five years or more, I was brought face to face with the reality of curses, which is totally scriptural. The word curse is used more than 200 times in the Bible. And I discovered that one root problem that keeps multitudes of Christians, all that God intends them to enjoy, is the existence of a curse over their lives. Now, when I was here in New Zealand last time, I preached on this in Wellington Town Hall, and it was one of the most powerful things I've ever been privileged to participate in. And the repercussions of that have been felt all around New Zealand. A, a printed version of my message was produced here by Warren and has circulated in New Zealand, and I've no doubt it's available if you want to purchase it. Later, in my radio program, which most of you are familiar with, I devoted two weeks of teaching to the theme from curse to blessing. And in advance, we produced a transcript of my messages. And two weeks, I told people if that message seemed to meet the need, they should write in for a free copy of the transcript. Now, the program was aired for two weeks to about 65 stations in the United States. And in response, more than 6,000 people wrote in for the transcript. That is more than three times the response we've ever had to any of my other messages. And for instance, my message on rejection, cause and cure, which most of you I'm sure have heard, had produced a tremendous response. But the response to this message on curses was just staggering. So this past month, we aired again for two weeks, and the response was even greater. And more than 6,000 people wrote in for the transcript. And with their letters, many of them submitted testimonies of the remarkable change that had taken place in their lives when they followed me in the prayer with which I closed those messages, a prayer of relief from curses. I would say in my own experience in ministry, I have seen more dramatic, large-scale results from teaching on curses than from any other ministry. And many of you know I've had a lot of dramatic results from teaching on deliverance from evil. I've, there's a number of my messages that produce dramatic results. But this message, from curse to blessing, is in a class by itself at the present time. Now I just relate that because I want you to see that it was not my initiative. And I'm always afraid of anything that I initiate. But God initiated this new thrust of seeking him in his word, the truth that needed for his people. Because of the experience that I've had in fulfillment of that promise that I would be able to release people from curses, I am truly satisfied that that particular prophetic message was inspired and given by God. That is, as it were, objective confirmation. So God has declared all-out war and witchcraft. You need to know that. God very clearly challenged Ruth me. To, in, to join him in that war. I don't think we could say enlist. We were conscripted. I'm not sure it had been left to us to enlist we would, whether we would have decided to do so. And so one of the results was that I began to say to myself, well, what is witchcraft? What is the nature of it? I had already encountered the spirit of witchcraft in the ministry of deliverance. Now this will probably may shock you, but 
what startled me was I encountered it so often in churches. And generally speaking, it was in the most unexpected people, like the pastor's wife or the deacon's daughter or the church soloist. And after a while, I began to say to myself, you know, could this be true? And uh, at a certain point in my ministry, and I'm rather glad that it's true any longer in that sense, when I came close to certain people, they would start to tremble. And they'd say to me, I don't know what's the matter with me, but every time I come near you, I tremble. Well, I would say to them, I know what's the matter with you. I've learned by experience. You need deliverance from witchcraft. So then I said to God, God, if this is true, I don't want to be, I don't want to get into error. I don't want to do something that's off the truth. What is the nature of witchcraft? And the answer I got at that time was this. Witchcraft is the attempt to control people and get them to do what you want them to do by the use of any spirit which is not the Holy Spirit. And then God added this all of If any person has a spirit which he or she can use, it is not the Holy Spirit. Because no one uses the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Well, that satisfied my need in the ministry deliverance. But when God thrust me into this further aspect of the war, I did further study on witchcraft. And I want to share my conclusions with you briefly. I don't know whether I have got you with me, but I wanted you to know that in my opinion this is not irrelevant. This is something which in one way or another probably concerns every person in this auditorium at this time. You may think it sounds far out and improbable. I think you're mistaken. I'd like to go now to scripture in 1 Samuel, chapter 15, which I think is a key text. These are words that were spoken by the prophet Samuel to King Saul after Saul had been sent on a mission to destroy the Amalekites and had returned without fulfilling his mission. He claimed to have done what God said, but he had to. We won't go into the details, except let me share the lesson of that story with you, if I may. Because I was teaching it years back in King in East Africa to the students in the teacher training college of which I was principal. And one of the principles we gave them for teaching Bible stories was you had to teach the lesson of glory. So I was doing this as a model lesson. And having gone through the lesson, I was walking to the chalkboard and I said to them, the lesson of this story is this. And between my desk and the chalkboard, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, I'll tell you the lesson of this story. <laughs> and when I got to the chalkboard, I knew what it was. Incomplete obedience is disobedience. <laughs> Meditate on that one for a moment. Saul did as much what God required as suited him, and he claimed to have obeyed God. Samuel said, on the contrary, you have disobeyed. Could it be true of some of us that when God tells us to do certain things, we do as much as seems good and we're willing to do and leave some of it undone, and then say, God, we obeyed you. But God says, incomplete obedience is disobedience. And this is what Samuel then said to Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22-3. Then Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. In other words, all your religious activities and sacrifices and offerings are of no value if they're accompanied by obedience. Disobedience robs them of all value. And then, 
Samuel went on to make this remarkable statement. Remember, he made it to the king of Israel. In essence, he accused the king of Israel of witchcraft. And the, the essence of what Samuel said is that before Saul died, he actually ended up consulting a witch. That was no accident. It started when he disobeyed the word of God. Samuel said, for rebellion is as the sin of God, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Brothers and sisters, could it be that in certain circumstances that would be said to us? Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you from your office, your position, your responsibilities, your ministry. Now, Samuel uses two words, rebellion and stubbornness. He says rebellion is the same as witchcraft, stubbornness is the same as idolatry. Let me tell you in my simple words the difference between rebellion and stubbornness. Rebellion says, I won't do it. Stubbornness says, I'll do it my way. <laughs> I tell you, I'd much rather deal with rebellion than stubbornness. You've got something clear cut to deal with. And it says stubbornness is the same as idolatry. You see, we would not accept in our churches, I suppose, people who openly worship idols. But we tolerate a lot of stubborn people in our churches. You are pastor. <laughs> Not right now. Shall I tell you one aspect of the idolatry of stubbornness? A stubborn person makes idols of his own opinion. And that's idolatry. We're not going to deal with stubbornness. We're going to deal with rebellion. Rebellion, Samuel says, is equivalent to witchcraft. Now that's the key to understanding. I'll try and explain it to you this way. Rebellion consists first and foremost setting aside the legitimate authority of God. Whether it's God himself, or a God-appointed ruler, or a God-appointed figure of authority. It might be a father, a husband, a pastor, or someone else. But all true authority has only one ultimate source, which is God. But rebellion rejects the authority of God and rejects the person who represents God's authority. And so it's setting aside the legitimate authority of God. But you can't live in rebellion without some substitute. You can't live without any kind of authority. So the second phase of rebellion is inserting or installing or substituting an illegitimate authority. And that illeg illegitimate authority has to be supported by sign of power. And the power that supports illegitimate authority is witchcraft. Once you see that, it'll open up whole vistas of truth to you. Witchcraft is the power, the illegal power, the evil power that supports illegal, illegitimate authority. Authority that's against the authority of God. Now in nations, which is a study in witchcraft and its consequences, Paul points out that there are two aspects of witchcraft. In Galatians, 5 and 20, Paul lists the works of the flesh. He begins in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, and so on. Now if you have the authorized version instead of sorcery, it says what? Witchcraft. That's right. So witchcraft is a work of the flesh. It's an expression of man's disobedient, carnal nature. Let me say a little bit about the words we use so that we don't get confused. 
in the English language, there are three main area words in this area. There's witchcraft, there is divination, and there is sorcery. They're all part of one package deal. If you want a distinction, witchcraft operates primarily through spells and curses. Divination is the fortune-telling aspect, and every fortune-teller is demonstrating divination. And sorcery operates through some kind of object to gain for over people. Like, one example is love potion. You want to make somebody fall in love with you, so you put something in his drink that makes him love you. In Africa, the majority of barren women, more than 90%, they can't have children, will go to the witch doctor and get a potion that will enable them to become pregnant. That's sorcery. Sorcery operates charm, through superstition, through lucky horseshoes, through black cat. And it operates through music. This is nothing new to those who spend them in Africa. Basically, most original Aphrodite was designed to expose people to demonic power. And they would go on beating the drums and dancing until the demon entered. That was what they were aiming for. Well, it came from Africa, way of South America to America, and we call it rock and roll, but the same power is in it. You watch a teenager who goes in and listens for a couple of hours to that music, and that young person will come out with glazed eyes. They're under a different power. Now, I'm not really concerned whether we use the word witchcraft or sorcery. Whichever I use, it's one and the same thing. Let's stick with witchcraft. So witchcraft is a work of the flesh. Now that would surprise you if you didn't didn't uh, go to the scripture for revelation. What is the way that the fleshly nature expresses witchcraft? Well, it sets aside divinely appointed authority. It may be in the home, Maybe in the church, maybe in the school, it may be in various areas. The three key words that represent witchcraft are manipulate, intimidate, and dominate. And wherever you meet manipulation, intimidation, and domination, you're in contact with witchcraft. God never manipulates. He never intimidates, and he never dominates. Which is the way that the disobedient, rebellious, fleshly nature gets what it wants. Man was born to have dominion, maybe to have dominion. When he fell, he lost the right to have legitimate dominion. And as long as he was in rebellion against God, he could not exercise legitimate dominion. So, he still has the desire to dominate, but he can't use legitimate authority, so he uses witchcraft. And you find this prevalent all through our culture. Let me give you just some simple examples. You start with a little baby in its crib. Its nappy is wet, it's uncomfortable, so it starts to cry. Along comes mummy, finds out the problem is, picks it up, changes the nappy, and pulls it. Well, next time it wants to be cuddled, it cries as if its nappy was wet. But it isn't. What's that? Manipulation. <laughs> How early does it start? <laughs> See, I'm not talking about something from the moon or the little girl wants 
a, I was going to say a candy, but I'm realizing I'm in the wrong place to say that, wants a sweet. But mummy doesn't want to give her a sweet, but a neighbor's come in to visit. And the little girl comes and says, mummy, can I have a sweet? And she says, no. And the little girl starts to act up and scream, and the mother is embarrassed. So in order to quieten her, she gives her the sweet. What? Manipulation. The little girl knew that while the neighbor was there, then they wouldn't enforce it. Perhaps the commonest general expression of witchcraft is the way wives deal with their husbands. <laughs> <laughs> no, you may think I'm joking, but I, I mean, uh, you can smile, but I'm not the least bit joking. I would have to say, let's take another nation so as we don't embarrass ourselves here. I would have to say, in the United States, there are millions of women who've never known any other way to deal with men but to manipulate. Oh, you don't really love me. Oh, you don't care for me. I feel so hurt. What do you want? I want a new dress. <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit, it's done with more subtlety than that. There it is. In the 1960s, in the United States, a book was published called How to Be a Jewish Mother. It was written by a Jewish young man, and uh, his mother wrote the production. And she said, I know this is a book. I haven't read it, but my son wrote it. <laughs> it's a it is a classic study in witchcraft. There's a whole series of different applications, but one of the lessons is entitled How to Learn to Play the Violin in Public Without Using Any Motivation But Guilt. <laughs> you know how much your father and I paid for your lesson? Here's your aunt Jemima, and she's come all this way, and she's just come to hear you play. Let me tell you, any time people use guilt to get you to do things, they're manipulating you. God never does that. So the divine way is to be honest, to be open, to confront one another in love. There's many other forms of manipulation. A father tends rather than manipulate to intimidate. He may, he has a son. This is such a common scenario. He's a critical man. He's a perfectionist. He's quick tempered. His children don't live up to his standards. And every time they displease him, he throws a fit in. Well, the result is that everybody in the family will do anything. They'll bend over backwards to avoid another of those fits of rain. What is that? Manipulation or intimidation, whatever you like to call it. See, it's always an Ill illegitimate way of getting what you want. Then you come into church life. Because so now we're in dangerous territory, but... Uh, Many, thank God not all, but many ministers are very insecure persons. I mean, I know hundreds, I'm not theorizing. I think insecurity, greatest single personal problem of men in the ministry. And an insecure person is liable to act in very, in some ways, illogical ways. So the pastor is building his congregation and he struggles along till he gets a hundred people and he's working hard at it and one of the main families decides to go to another church. This of course never happens in New Zealand. So uh, now this threatens his ego, understand? It threatens his security. So it's something like, I promise you this, if you leave this church, you'll never prosper. You'll never be successful wherever you go. I've talked to many people and that kind of pronouncement made upon them. What is that? Witchcraft. Right inside the ministry. 
Another way that happens, none of you have ever seen this, but here's the young Pentecostal pastor struggling to maintain his congregation, and there are two ladies in church who have been Christians 40 years each, and they know exactly what that pastor to do. And every time he steps out of line, one of them gets a message in tongues and the other gets the interpretation. <laughs> and between them, they tell him what to do. But of course, how can he argue? Because it's... <laughs> <laughs> no, don't look around. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the people that are exposed to suffer more than you can understand. Whether it's the young pastor, or whether it's the family that were threatened with disaster if they would leave the church. They're just two out of many different ways. I'm just awakening your understanding to begin to recognize this. Because when I describe it accurately, you'll see that it's not something from the moon. It's something that fills our society our families, and our churches. We are not different, in most cases, from the Galatians. By the time we've been through this, I think you'll see. Then, there's a um, very common example. And I'm talking about this because it's so relevant. And uh, you can put me, if you like, in the picture. I trust by the grace of God I'm not guilty of this. But it's the man who's building his ministry. And he's got a program to maintain, either television or video or radio. And he needs support. And he says to the people, now if you'll offer $50 ministry, you'll get $500 back from God. <laughs> God has shown me there are 10 people here tonight who'll give $1,000 each. Now, it's possible that God really did show him that. But in most cases, God didn't. It was a strategy that he worked out. To what? To manipulate. I think that in the United States, I would say probably billions of dollars are manipulated out of God's people. Sometimes I could weep at the gullibility of the people of God. I'm going to talk a little further about ministries that become corrupt. I think New Zealand got a bit more sense. I think it would take a more powerful brand of witchcraft to get money out of New Zealand. <laughs> But you're not immune, brothers and sisters. Don't imagine you are not immune. Now, I think we're pretty close to the end of our first session, and I think I have to start basically where I've got to, because I don't want to start on a new area. But I just want to make it clear to you that I'm not going to major on negative. I'm going to present the problem, and when you see the problem, I'm going to show you the solution. And the marvelous thing about the Bible is that Galatians not only presents them, it presents the solution.
And we saw that it was witchcraft, something that would probably be surprising and shocking to many Christians who read the New Testament many times, but never seen that. Perhaps or even more surprising and shocking would be my statement that I think the same problem is common in multitudes of churches today. I pointed out that Paul shows in Galatians chapter 5 where he lists the works of the flesh that witchcraft is a work of the flesh. It's an expression of man's unregenerate, rebellious nature. It's one of the ways in which man seeks to regain his lost dominion without meeting God's condition. And I pointed out that the three key words that are indicative of witchcraft are the words See if you can remember them. Manipulate, intimidate, and dominate. All right. Now, the second aspect of witchcraft which we're going to look at now is that it is also an evil spiritual power. And it emanates from Satan. Satan is the arch lord, and he has a kingdom of rebellious angels. And their aim is to gain dominion over the human race. Their dominion is illegitimate. It's not from God's authority, which they've forfeited by their rebellion. Consequently, the means by which they seek to gain dominion is illegitimate power, summed up in one word, which is which. That's right. Witchcraft is a power that Satan and his rebellious angels use to gain control of humanity. And it is actually the natural religion of fallen man. In other words, everywhere in the world, in the history of the human race, where there has been religion that has not had its basis in the Word of God, that religion is witchcraft. It is the normal religion of man in his unregenerate, rebellious state. And it's found in almost every nation on earth, in almost every continent, every land. Whether you're Africa, Asia, South America, islands of the Pacific, Europe, makes no difference. North America, South America, original religion was witchcraft. That makes it very simple when you grasp that fact. In certain areas of the earth, Christianity has driven witchcraft back. But nowhere has it totally, finally overthrown witchcraft. And one of the features of our contemporary situation is that Satan, by witchcraft, is seeking to restore the power that he exercised to those primitive religions. Nowhere is this more obvious than in New Zealand today, where there is a tremendous research of the original religions or religion of these islands. You see, once you've grasped that simple fact, you can see history and the world situation much greater clarity. It's no longer a kind of confused blur of different pressures and forces, but you see the essential nature is the same everywhere. It's got other different forms, different in South America from what it is in Africa, from what it is in Asia, but the essential nature of primitive religion that has not been based on the scripture is witchcraft. Now, I have said that witchcraft establishes an illegitimate authority. I'm saying, Paul said, 
witchcraft was operating in the churches of Galatia. The first evidence was that they'd lost the vision of the cross. They were no longer clear as to what had been accomplished by the death of Jesus on the cross on their behalf. And when they lost the vision, they began to forfeit the benefit. And the two immediate results, which Paul pinpoints, were clarity and legalism. And I would venture to say to you that in most places, where you find carnality and legalism in the church today, the same cause has produced the same effect. We are dealing with witchcraft. Let's look at some of the statements that Paul makes. And let me point out also that the result of witchcraft taking over is that people come back under bondage. <coughs> Now, bridge is a nice authorized version word that we're used to in religious circles. But a real problem meaning is slavery. And let's say it very simply, witchcraft produces slavery. I read a passage in Galatians 4. Paul brings this out. Very remarkable passage. I'm not sure that I fully understand the implications of it. But at least a major part of it is clear. Paul is talking about the difference between the condition of people under the law of Moses and those who become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And because children, Paul says, all heirs. And he explains it this way. We're in Galatians 4, beginning at verse 1. Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Paul is saying out that while Israel were under the law, though they were due to be heirs, they were actually in a condition similar to slavery. He is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, Paul is talking primarily as an Israelite, even we, when we were children, were in bondage, slavery, to the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sought his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. To redeem them from what? From slavery to the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You see, the choice is simple. It's a son or being a slave. But when God's people lose the vision of the cross and what has been accomplished by it, and come back under the influence of witchcraft, they lose the experiential status of sons and become slaves again. So Paul goes on. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God. Paul on. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which desire again to be in slavery? See what we're just doing? Is thrusting the next into a condition of slavery to a natural system, weak and beggarly element. You observe days, months, and seasons and years, all aspects of the law. I am afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain. That's a stunning statement, isn't it? As I pointed out, these people weren't drunkards, they weren't fornicators. But Paul was really, in a way, much more concerned about their condition than he was about the other. And then if you go on a little further in Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty by, by which Christ has made free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of slavery. What was the yoke of slavery? Legalism. It was Pressing that yoke upon them, witchcraft. 
Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you come circumcised, that is, in order to keep the law, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. If you want to start seeking to achieve righteousness by keeping the law, you've got to keep the whole law all the time. The first thing is keeping part of the law at part of the time. It's either the whole law or all the time, or you cannot achieve righteousness by it. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Those are tremendously serious words. But the two elements in that situation that I want to focus on are the evil power of which the result which it produces, which is slavery. And slavery is manifested in what we call legalism. We look also for a moment in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Romans 8, 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. How do you qualify to be a son of God? By being led by the Spirit of God. Verse 16. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Out, Abba, Father. See again, it's the same alternative. Are you going to be a son or are you going to be a slave? You've been released from the slavery of the law, but if you go back under the law, you become a slave once again. And the pressure that's causing you to do that is the unseen evil power is witchcraft. Then going in Romans chapter 8, Verse 7 and 8, Paul says, The carnal mind, the fully mind, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It doesn't matter how hard you try to please God, if you're doing it out of your fleshly nature, you cannot do it. It is impossible. Those who are flesh cannot please God. When we come under legalism, we come into the flesh, and no matter how hard we struggle and how many rules we observe, how earnest we are, we cannot please God. We have become slaves instead of sons. Now, I say that the effect of witchcraft is to establish an illegal dominion to set aside the legitimate authority of God and to substitute an illegal dominion. If this is so, then we need to ask ourselves, what is the illegal dominion that is established by legalism? What has it done? What has it reversed of God's plan and God's order? And I would say this, it restores the illegitimate, illegitimate dominion of the flesh, the carnal nature, over the spirit. And the result is slavery. In what way do we see this manifested in the church? Countless ways. But let me offer you some, a few examples. We place theology above revelation. We place the mind above, above the spirit. Now I would say, and you are free to, to question this, the majority of Christian groups are operating on the basis of theology. Theology has been exalted. But theology is the product 
of the natural mind. Christianity comes by revelation. You don't understand the Bible by reasoning. I tried to do that as a philosopher. I couldn't make sense of it. You only understand the Bible by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And basically, you will find that the people who try to establish reason and intellectual processes as the basis of the order of the church have set aside the moving of the Holy Spirit and ultimately the authority of Scripture. They have placed education above discipleship. How many of Jesus' disciples ever went to a theological institution? You know, it's common, and I mean, it's, it's done with me, so I'm not criticizing anybody. When, when a preacher or an author presents himself in Christian circles, they give his educational qualifications. He graduated from such and such college and he obtained his master's degree here and his doctorate here. And really, the general attitude of the church is if he doesn't have that, he's not worth me to. Well, in that case, the Emperor Jesus made a very bad choice. And he did not take his disciples into a classroom. <laughs> he trained them in action. The education is no substitute for disciples. Education is the carnal approach. Discipling is a spiritual process. This illegitimate order that we're talking about puts eloquence and method and program over supernatural direction and supernatural power. My impression is, and you again are free to correct me, that the majority of religious leaders in the church today are afraid of anything they can't control. But anything they can control lacks the power to do the job. What has been, what has happened? The carnal mind has been reestablished as the ruler over the spirit. Paul has got some things to say about the carnal mind. In Romans 8 verse 7, he says, The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. There's no way that the carnal mind can submit itself to God. The, basically, when we insist that candidates for the ministry, quote, attend theological institutions, and often for many years, what we need is educating the carnal. But at the end of all that, all you've got is an educated enemy of God. I mean, I, I mean, I, mean I, I can understand your smile, it's not, I'm not jesting. And I would say probably the most virulent opponents of God and the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures are the products of seminary. Now, I have no desire to speak evil of anybody, but I just want to state the fact. And I want to lay bare the root cause. The root cause is that the divine order of spirit over mind has been reversed. The fleshly nature has put in authority over the spiritual. Esau has been given authority over Jacob. You can give it a not a half a dozen different expressions. And we're so used to it being that way that it takes a real jolt from the Holy Spirit to see how truly contrary it is to the divine order. I really aim not to speak disrespectfully of anybody. But I have to, I believe I have to obey what 
God has been so great. The church is living up down. Now, I mean, there are wonderful exceptions. Thank God I've been privileged to be amongst those are the exceptions in many different cases. But if you view the church as we know it as a whole, the divine order has been reversed. And man's carnal nature has been reinstated as the authority. What is the power that's done that? Which one? That's my conviction. You see, I personally believe the problem of the Galatian church is the commonest single problem in the church today as we know it. George Burwer, who's the founder of Operation Mobilization, said in one of his books that the greatest sink stumbling block in the church to convert is legalism. And I agree to that personally. I think that's right. Let's just contrast that with what Paul said. Let's look at the order that Paul established and contrast it with what we know. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now when you read this, you need to bear in mind that the historical background is Acts chapter 17 and 18. In chapter 17, Paul was in Athens which is the university city of the ancient world. And he gave a lecture to the political leaders. And it was a very intellectual discourse. And he did their own thing. He sought to meet them on their own ground. But the results spiritually were very meager. A few people believed. And Paul went on from Athens to Corinth, which was a large, wicked, port city with all the typical vices and problems of a port city and somewhere between Athens and Corinth Paul made a decision and he said in effect I'm never going to do again what I did in Athens and this is his decision and I brethren when I came to you did not come with excellent speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God for I determined I made up my mind not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What was he focusing on? The cross. He said, that was my mistake in Athens. I didn't tell them about the cross. He said, I'm not going to make mistakes in Corinth. I'm going to forget all I knew. I'm not going to quote poets and philosophers and psychiatrists. Because he didn't say psychiatrists. That's just added by the prince. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. What's the alternative? The supernatural power of the spirit demonstrated. And he gives a reason. Verse 5, that your faith should not be in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I want your faith based on theology, on religious theory, on intellectual discourses. I want your faith based on one thing, a personal experience of the supernatural power of God in your own life. I can identify with that because I was in educational work in East Africa. Five years I was principal of a college for training African teachers for African schools in Kenya. And I primary purpose was to win them for Christ, although I also was responsible for their education. And after a while, I realized that they were immunized to the kind of Christianity that they had been exposed to. And that just kind of teaching wasn't getting anywhere. So I called the student body together, because I was about a hundred 20 students, and I said, um, now I want to thank you that you're really very obedient and very cooperative, and whatever we tell you to do, you do. You read, you read, if we say be baptized, you get baptized. And I said, I know the reason why, because your education depends on obeying us, and education is the thing you want more than anything else. 
I used to tell the Africans have changed their gods. They used to have gods of wood and stone, and now they have a new god, and I said in Swahili, his name is Limu, which is the Swahili word for education, which was exactly the situation. But I said to them, somewhere in the backs of your minds, there is a big unanswered question. They got very interested at that, and I said, this is the question. Is the Bible a book for Africans, or is it really just a white man's book that doesn't work for Africans? That's your point. I said, many of your own African elders are telling you the Bible is just a white man's book, and Africans can't be expected to follow it. Then I said to them, and I want to tell you something more, I can't answer that question for you. Well, that surprised them because they thought teachers and missionaries could answer every question. I said, there's only one way you ever find the answer to that question. If you have a personal experience of the supernatural power of God in your own life, you know what thing for It didn't come from America and it didn't come from Britain. And until that happens, you won't know. And I went away and I put it. About six months later, a young man came with never being beyond us four with a rather broken down um, musical instrument. And he started to declare the truth of Jesus. And of course, they despised him, lectures far less educated than they were. But the power of God came and broke out upon those people and the supernatural sovereign visitation of the Holy Spirit and basically almost every student in that body was supernaturally touched by God. Up to that time we give them lectures about praying before they went to bed. After that we stopped them praying. They prayed all night. And during the next Twelve months, I would say, we saw all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit manifested amongst those young people. Well, then I called them together and I said, now I want to tell you something. Now you know that it didn't come from America and it didn't come from Britain. You've had it in your own life. And this is God's personal testimony to you that the Bible is true. And that he's doing what he said to in Acts chapter 2, he's pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. Young men are seeing visions, our old men are dreaming dreams, and the maidens from the servants are prophesying. And that place was revolutionary. In the course of the next years, we saw two people raised from the dead. And it has been a permanent lesson to me. Any kind of effective faith is not built on human wisdom. Built on the supernatural power of God. And saints, one of his favorite tactics is to get us substituting education, human wisdom, theology, and theory for the sovereign supernatural work of the Spirit of God. I'll tell you one good reason why our faith should not be based on human wisdom, because it changes with every generation. And if you base your faith on the wisdom of the previous generation, it will be out of date. Look also in 1 Corinthians 4.20, if you will. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. It's not what we say, it's the power that works in us and through us. Now, I tried briefly, and I could have spoken at much greater length, to analyze the specific problem of the Galatian churches as revealed in Paul's epistles to the Galatians. I don't want to focus on the problem. I trust that in some way I've shown you it's a real, up-to-date problem. It's not something that exists among primitive people, or in past generations. I think the problem is as prevalent in the contemporary church as it ever has been in any generation. And now I understand why God said that he was declaring all out war on which I understand also, I think to some degree, what he meant when he said that it had bound millions of men who were needed in his army. 
Now, I want to go to remedy. The wonderful thing about this inspired word of God is that Galatians is I mean, Paul didn't sit down to write a theological treatise. He didn't have a concordance. He didn't have a library. He might not have even had a desk to write up. He probably wrote it from somebody's home when he was in the middle of counseling people. All sorts of things were going on all around him. And he pens this letter and its structure is simple, that it analyzes the problem and states the remedy. And the remedy is the cross. There is no other remedy. And I want to look at five different ways in which the cross needs to be applied in the life of Christ. A friend of mine, one actually who's responsible for administering our Asian outreach, the one who supervises our Chinese broadcast, who's also a graduate of Cambridge. <laughs> After all, some people can escape. <laughs> I escaped for five and a half years in the British Army. That de Cambridge me. <laughs> My first wife, Lydia, said if I hadn't been in the army, she'd have never met me if I'd come straight from Cambridge. <laughs> well, not well on that thing, anyhow. But anyhow, this dear brother, who's a man of real perception, I was with him in Singapore you know, a year ago, and he just said to me casually, he said, the church has got so many things in its shop window, the cross has lost sight of. And that really stayed with me. I mean, the church is offering so much. Prosperity, healing, insight, success, power, that, you know, the cross is just somewhere amongst all these items away. That's a totally wrong picture. Everything that God provides depends on the cross. And unless we restore the cross rightful position, we cannot be the kind of people God wants us to be, and we cannot have the kind of inheritance that God has provided for us. I'm going to speak about five different ways revealed in nation in which the cross needs to be applied in the life of every believer, including friends. Now, the cross is also the source of God's total provision for every need. Every need that you have, spiritual, physical, material, financial, in time or eternity, God has supplied but one thing, the cross. But I'm going to speak in these talks on what the cross has done for us. I want to speak about what the cross should do in us. And that's very seldom dealt with in contemporary Christianity. Turn first of all to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. This is part of Paul's reading and it actually is the the text that opens up the whole revelation. We read verses 3 and 4. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sin. Where did he give himself for our sin? On the cross. That he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. That's the first provision of the cross that needs to be applied in our lives, deliverance from this present evil age. In the Christian circles in which I move, and I see a good variety of Christians from different backgrounds and different nationalities, I don't think there's one in a hundred at the present time that isn't even aware that the cross has provided deliverance for us from this present evil age. I'd like to make some statements out of scripture concerning this age. Let me say first of all, the word translated age in Greek is ion, from which we get the English word eon, and it is a certain specific time period. 
we're living in a in an age, a time period. But through the cross, God has made provision for us to be delivered from this present evil age. Let me ask you a simple question. How many of you were aware of that? Just, yes, there are some, thank God. But I mean it's one in twenty at the most. That's that would say that's a rather better than usual average in the contemporary church. Let me therefore try to give you some explanation of why we need to be delivered from this present evil age. Because if you're not convinced you need to be delivered, it's improbable that you'll seek deliverance. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13 for a moment. This is the great chapter of the parables. And in interpreting these parables, Jesus makes the same statement several times. This present age is coming to an end. It's not going to last forever. Do you realize that? All right. Matthew chapter 13, verse 39. This is the parable of the tares in February. The enemy who sowed them is the death. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers of the angels. This age is coming to an end. Verse 40. Therefore as the tares gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. You could say, in a way, one focus of these parables is the end of this age. And then in verse 49, the parable of the dragnet, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and separate the wicked from among the just. And you could find many other similar references. Now this is a very simple fact, but it's of tremendous importance. This age is not going to continue forever. I personally say, thank God. Paul calls it an evil age. And it's going to be an evil age as long as it continues. The second statement explains why it's an evil age. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, we read verse 3 as well. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who is the God of this age? Satan. That's why it's an evil age. As long as he's the God of this age, it's going to be an evil age. That's why Satan doesn't want this age to end. Because when this age ends, he'll no longer be a God. But as long as this age continues, he'll be the God of this age. Hebrew chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. Paul is speaking about certain experiences that are pattern experiences for us as Christians. Now in this theme, he's saying that people who have these experiences and turn away from God deliberately, they have no further opportunity of repentance. That's not what I'm dealing with. I'm just going to deal with the experience. If you look now, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. And I want you to notice these experiences. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened have tasted the gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come. There are five successive experiences. They've been enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gift, which is salvation and eternal life in Christ, have been partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. You see, through the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we get a taste of the powers of the next age. We are lifted in that experience from our being totally immersed in this age to the realization that there's another age coming in which what is now supernatural will be natural. We taste it in advance. And I believe one purpose of God in permitting us to taste it is that we lose our taste for this age. Verse 
Then again in Matthew 13, 22, going back to that chapter of the parables, Matthew 13, 22, interpreting the parable of the sower, Jesus speaks about the one who received the seed among thorns, and he says, Now he who received among, among the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word of God, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now I'm reading the New King James, but it's an unfortunate fact that both the authorized version and the New King James use the phrase world, because Greek is age. Or any of you that have a modern translation, NASB, NIV, it's age. Isn't that right? Yes. Cares of this age, what do they do to a Christian? They took the seed of the word of God. That's another reason why we need to be delivered from present evil age. And then in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul says to Christians, do not be conformed to this world, I mean the New King James, but the Greek word is age. Again, those of you the modern translation, it says age, doesn't it? That's right. You see, age is a period of time, world is a theological setup. Both have their place in New Testament theology, but we shouldn't confuse them. We're dealing at present moment with this present period of time, this age. And it produces cares, anxieties, worries, ambitions, which choke the seed of the word of God. And then Paul says now, in Romans 12, two, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and accept perfect will of God. So Paul says, we are not to be like the people who belong in this age. We don't belong in this age. We've been delivered from it. We're not to be of the same mold as those people. Because we are to be transformed, not so much by a set of outward rules, so much of religion consists in a set of rules. Don't do this, don't go there, don't touch that, don't wear that. And I'm being through it. I can give you the rules. But God doesn't change people by rules. He changes them in their thinking. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you think differently, you live differently. When you think like the world, you can change a little bit on the outside, but you're still really just the same inside. <laughs> Let me ask you something. How do you respond when you suddenly get bad news? That's one of the ways of finding out whether you've been renewed in your mind or not. <laughs> we just had the test. <laughs> we came from Hawaii by way of Tonga. Checked our baggage in and away, and not nothing arrived in Tonga. Not one out of four suitcases. I'd have to say, by the grace of God, we were renewed in our mind. We didn't worry, didn't get upset, just prayed. Sure enough, they turned up this morning, Auckland. But if they hadn't turned up, we still wouldn't have been upset. All this outward conformity was sent really doesn't turn an inward. It's a substitute for inward transformation. It's legalism. We've got to be changed in the way we think. Our values, our standards, our motives, our reaction. It's not so much your action that gives you way, it's your reaction. Then you know whether you've been renewed in the spirit of your mind. Or then you'll know whether you've been delivered from this present evil age. And then in Second Timothy chapter 4, 
Paul makes a very sad statement about one of his trusted co-workers who had been with him many years, shared much hardship and labor with him. And he says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, but word is age, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. It's unfortunate that the, the authorized version doesn't distinguish because it, it, it leads to confusion. But if you, if you go to one of the modern translations or you use a concordance, you can find out. If you use a concordance, it takes you behind the translation to the original. Now, I think that's a great tragedy. After all these years, I mean, Demas was one of Paul's trusted co-workers. He went off. He left him in prison, left him in love. Why? Why did he? Because he loved this present age. You cannot love this present age and be a faithful Christ. It will show one day you may go through the motions for years. There will come a moment where the love of this age will make you unfaithful to Christ. You cannot love both. Let's look quickly at what I've pointed to you about this present age. First of all, it's coming to a close. It's not going to last forever. It's not. Secondly, Satan is the god of this thing. And it bears all the marks of Satan upon it. Third, we have tasted the powers of a new age, and that should have been such an appetite that we're no longer tempted by this age. Fourth, it creates all these worries that make us unfruitful. They choke the word of God. Fifth, believers must not be conformed to this present age. And sixth, a servant of Christ cannot love this present age and be faithful to Christ. Now let us briefly consider in closing what a result of deliverance from this present evil age. What will we find in us and experience if we have availed ourselves of this deliverance? The first is citizenship in heaven. Philippians chapter 3. Verses 17 and following. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I will tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Was he talking about unbelievers? Obviously not. Were they the enemies of Christ? No. What were they the enemies? The cross. That's the thing they didn't like. Oh, they liked Jesus. He was a wonderful teacher. He saved them from so much. They'd been in prison, all sorts of things. And he'd got them out of it. But there's one thing they didn't like at all was the cross. They were the enemies of the cross. That affected the way they lived. Listen. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their stomach, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. What are the causes of those? What is the cause of all those? They didn't like God. And Paul says, for our citizenship is in heaven which also we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be come to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to do all things to himself. Now, you really don't qualify to have citizenship in heaven if you hate the cross. It's possible to be very religious and still reject the cross. 
Somebody said this, and I may say it more than once, the cross is where God's will and our will cross. There's lots of people about religious members stop at the point where God's will and their will cross. This passage also brings out a second related consequence of deliverance from this grand evil age. The excited anticipation of the Lord's return. We are legally waiting a Savior from heaven. Let me give you two other passages. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear the second time, apart from sin for salvation. To whom will he appear? To those who eagerly wait for him. If you're at home in age, you can't be eagerly waiting for it's, it's impossible. Second Timothy chapter 4, let's go back to that chapter. I consider Second Timothy chapter 4 to be one of the great passages of English literature, amongst other things. Paul is here in prison, forsaken by his friends, some of them, cold, without his winter clothing, in chains, a wedding trial, and probable martyrdom. And he says, finally is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but all who have loved his appearing. The Greek word for love is agopao, it's the strongest word. Those who passionately loved his appearing. The international version says, those who long for his appearing. To whom will he award a crown of righteousness? Do what? Who what? Long for his appearing. Are you one of them? You see, if you're at home in this age, you will not long for his appearing. They're inconsistent. And finally, just to close briefly, and this is all closely related, the other consequence, deliverance from this present evil age, is that we have here no continuing city. Hebrews 3, 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Again, a mutually exclusive alternative. If you're perfect at home in this earth, you're not seeking the city that is to come. And let me close the scripture that has become very powerful in personal experience. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And simply verse 23. Verse 19, I'm sorry. Verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are out of all men the most pitiable. I think another translation says, the most to be pitied. I've heard so many people say, well, if I got nothing but what I got in this life in Christ, that would be wonderful. That's not what Paul says. He says, if our hope in Christ is in this life only, we are of all men the most to be pitied. Let me capitulate and close the results of deliverance from this present, present evil age. Citizenship in heaven. The eager expectation of Christ's turn and the fact that we have here no continuing city. Amen. Thank you. Great message. Be here again at night.